So one announcement that was uh, sent out earlier today, uh, we moved to Piazza. Uh, many of you spoke to me and also the TAs, you wanted to change our discussions from Canvas to Piazza. So um, we moved to Piazza. And uh, you can't be that happy for that, but okay. Um, so the, that also means that we will be deprecating discussions on the Canvas discussion board going ahead. So if there are any uh, any points that you want to discuss, anything that you want to discuss, use uh, uh, Piazza. Um, there's homework one that has been available on Canvas for um, a while now, and it's due next Tuesday. Um, if you haven't started already, please start soon. You'll be implementing decision trees, uh, playing with some variants, uh, use Piazza for discussions. Uh, and uh, do come to office hours because, uh, uh, you know, the, since, like I said uh, in the last lecture, this is the first homework, so you might have weird complications that you didn't think about. So uh, start early, and uh, if you have trouble, come to office hours. Any questions about homework one? Yes. One of the uh, attributes as a value that's missing, which is between that, like uh, what we talked about last class. Yeah. So you can use any of the methods that we discussed in the last lecture. Uh, make a choice and describe it in the text, uh, in your report, um, because, you know, th these are the kinds of things that might happen in real data. So you have to make these uh, sorts of choices. My recommendation is make the simplest choice that you can. Other questions? Uh, there were a couple of people who came to me and said, the performance of my decision tree on this data is really good. And that seems a little suspicious. I'll just give a hint on this data set, expect your decision tree to be actually really good. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think you asked me a question. So that's the answer. I'm not giving more details because uh, I don't want to start talking numbers. Any questions, any comments? Yes. Oh, uh, do you have a comment for the programming model? The pro what? The law. Well, what more should we bring? Oh, oh, the the report, the 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 PDF that we sent, okay. uh, that we uh, that describes the homework has a description of what you need to print. Please, once again, if you haven't started, start soon. Uh, this is if you've not done this kind of stuff before, it might take you know this is not the kind of stuff that you might want to do on the last day. If you've done this kind of stuff before, yeah, sure. Uh, it's fine. But uh, this, this is the first time you're um, doing these sorts of experiments and uh, building uh, trees. And if this, if this is the first time you're working with Python, for example, start soon. There's another, uh, uh, basically an update about projects. Um, we haven't uh, finalized the data set for the uh, class project yet, but uh, we'll get there soon. There's a milestone on Feb 15th, and this is uh, perhaps the simplest thing that you'll do in this entire semester. We'll give you a data set and some instructions. You download the data set. If you already, if you haven't created an account, if you don't have an account on Kaggle, create one. And you upload, you unzip the file that we give you, pick out one of the files, upload it to Kaggle. Kaggle will report a number. On Canvas, you need to tell us what that number is and what your Kaggle username is. This is mostly to kind of get the workflow going. Um, and the rest of the semester, you'll be, you won't be uh, uploading random files. You'll be uploading files that are predictions of your models. And, and you know, watch out for the details on, uh, on Canvas. Uh, at this point, I don't want to get spend too much time on this because this is just to kind of point out that there will be something for you to submit on Feb 15th. And it's a really, really easy thing to do. All it does is two things for me. One, it tells, well, it does one thing for you and one thing for me. For you, it uh, tells you how to kind of upload things on ca on Kaggle and get the whole process going. For me, it tells you tells me what your Kaggle username is. That way, I'll be able to grade your projects. If you don't do this one, then I'll have a hard time grading the rest of your project. So it's really minimal effort, but can have a big impact. Okay. Um, 
Any questions? Any questions about any of the things? Any logistical things you want to discuss before you want to be moved to the actual content? We push to the cloud logistics right now. Not now. Um, mm -hmm. You can do it on Feb 14th if you want, yeah. or 15th even. All right. So no, if there are no questions, um, let's pick up where we left off. We were talking about decision trees in the last lecture, and. Uh, Toward the end of the last lecture, uh, we pivoted from a discussion about decision trees per se to this general concept of overfitting. The idea that uh, your learning algorithm memorizes a training data so well that it does not do well on future examples. One way of kind of uh, thinking about this is uh, the learning algorithm finds the hypothesis. Remember, learning is search over hypothesis spaces. So learn the learning algorithm finds a hypothesis a function that fits the data so well, it fits not only the signal in the data, but also the noise. As a result, when new examples come in, it no longer does well. So the noise in the training data, um, the noise can take different forms. It can be from actual errors in the features of the labels. It could be, it could be irrelevant features that you added to the data because you didn't know better. One way or another, you have noise, and the noise has managed to confuse your learner into thinking this particular hypothesis is actually good, when in fact it's not. The only goal of learning, remember, is generalization. We don't care how well a classifier does on a training set, because if it does not do well on future examples, that's not a good classifier. And so overfitting can lead to uh, poor performance on future examples. And I illustrated this using this example of a first this made up function called the first bit function. Any questions about this general idea that uh, that we talked about? If not, I'm going to just uh, continue from this and talk about, uh, uh, you know, basically just formalize this a little bit. This will be the first of uh, two different ways in which we formalize uh, overfitting. But are there any questions about this general uh, concept? I can see you're all eager for formalization, so let's move on. So here's one definition, and it's not the only definition. In fact, this is a somewhat um, less strong definition than the one that we'll come to later. Um, imagine that your data comes from a certain probability distribution, and I'm calling that D. What that means is there is some distribution that uh, 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 that from which examples and labels are sampled. This distribution maybe maybe is unknown to us. And let's say that we have a hypothesis space H. What that means is your learning algorithm is going to search over all the functions in this hypothesis space to find uh, the best one. The best one according to what? The best one according to a training set. The training set is some set of a finite set of examples. And uh, using the training set, the learning algorithm is going to find a single hypothesis. And let's say that we use a little h uh, to denote the hypothesis that your learning algorithm returns. I can define two different types of two different notions of error. Here. There is the error on your training data. The error on the training data is simply the fraction of training examples that little h gets incorrect. That's that's an intuitive concept, right? So you the way to compute that is you just uh, enumerate every example in the training data, ask your classifier the, the hypothesis h for a, the label, look at the ground truth label, compare. If they are not the same, you have an error. And we're talking classification here. We can generalize this to regression also. So the training error is simply the fraction of training examples that are incorrectly predicted. But that's not what we care about. What we care about is the true error, sometimes also called the generalization error. And I'm using the notation error sub D of H. The generalization error of the classifier is the probability that this classifier will be wrong on a future example. 
And here the distributions are defined, the probability is defined with respect to this distribution here. On a randomly chosen example from that distribution that may not have been seen so far, what's the probability that this classifier is going to make a mistake? Okay. Before we move on, is this notion of generalization error or true error uh, clear? Remember that we can't actually compute it because we don't know the true distribution. Right? We don't know the true distribution, so we can't actually compute it. This is a this is a, a conceptual notion. On a randomly chosen example, according to that distribution, and uh, when I say randomly chosen example, there is this probability <laughs> distribution, and you are, you know, rolling a die or tossing a coin or whatever random generator that you use to pick an example. And then you ask your classifier, what's the label? And then you also know the ground truth because this example has been randomly chosen and labeled by the oracle. So you know the ground truth, you know the prediction, and you ask what's the error. You do that on one example. And uh, it, either there's an error or there's no error. It's a single, uh, it's, you know, yes or no. And so generalization error is what's the probability that there's an error on that randomly chosen example. So the, the hypothesis H that you're learning on random returns, or actually it's true for any hypothesis. The hypothesis H is said to overfit this training data, if there's a competing hypothesis called H prime. So there are two hypotheses here, H and H prime. So H has a lower error, lower training error than H prime. As a result, your learning error, the learning algorithm is kind of fooled into thinking H is better than H prime. But in fact, H prime generalizes better than H. So on one hand, the point number one here says your True error, the, gen, the training error of H is lower. Point two says, however, the generalization error of H prime is better than that of H. We can just replace this the, the word with symbols. The first point, the training error of H is less than the training error of H prime, is simply error train of H is less than error train of H prime. This is simply the fraction of examples that H predicts the fraction of training examples that H predicts correctly is less than the fraction of uh, is bare, is more than the fraction of training examples that H prime predicts uh, predicts correctly. H prime generalizes better than H, which is error D. The generalization error of H is more than the generalization error of H prime. If this situation happens, then we say that H prime has overfit the training data. Notice that here it's not talking about it's not really talking about H prime has overfit the data with respect to sorry H has overfit the data with respect to H prime. We're just saying H has overfit the data if there exists some other hypothesis which is better for generalization. We don't need to have that at hand. If we can prove that there exists another hypothesis, then we know that H is worse. I don't know how to prove it, but I'm just making the, just telling you the limits of this definition. Yes. So the, the true algorithm is. Uh... The true error is also called the generalization error. Because in, in real life, we can't know the distribution. We can't. So the question is, why do we assume we don't know the distribution? Because that is about as close as we can get to real life. In real life, we can't actually know the distribution. Imagine that I give you uh, uh, that the, the task here is predicting whether uh, uh, a, a, an image contains a cat or not. The distribution here is the probability distribution over all possible images. How could we possibly know the true distribution that in nature that generates images? Okay. You can, but that requires you to assume some uh, probability, some sort of a make some assumptions about what distribution the data is coming from. The most uh, uh, the most general setting here is, why do we need that distribution? In order to make, the, in order to define the thing, we don't need that distribution. So why make that assumption? Actually, we are not assuming that we don't know the distribution. We are, it's not an assumption that we don't know the distribution. In the general case, we don't know the distribution. Yes. Yes. So, 
That's right. Yes, that's right. Excellent point. So the question is, I said we can calculate the training error. Given the training data, we can calculate the training error. I also said the true error is this abstract concept. It's a probability that the classifier is going to be wrong on a future data point. We can't calculate it. So how do we calculate it? The way we calculate, the way, way we approximate it in real life is we use a test set and calculate the error on the test set for this. And the test set, that's why it is important that your learning algorithm never sees the test set because the, learn, the test set is supposed to be a representative of the future example. And it's used to calculate true errors. If the learning algorithm gets to see the test set during training, it might end up overfitting the test set also. Yes. If we have not overfit our test data for two error and then we have the buffering in a in an ideal world that is the case, but in practice, I hardly I don't think I've ever seen that. Um in an ideal case, maybe yes. So all of this is just this is just your first introduction to the concept of overfitting. Every learning algorithm, every classifier that you have runs the risk of overfitting. <laughs> And so we have to take explicit steps to avoid overfitting. Otherwise, your learners are very happy uh, to memorize the training data. So uh, let's take the case of decision trees. Imagine that you have one feature that is uh, only one feature, like the first bit function. There's only one feature that is relevant for classifying examples. And there are 20 other features that are irrelevant. And there's no actual data. It's entirely possible by statistical accidents, some of those 20 other features will line up neat, neatly with uh, positive or negative labels. You can keep partitioning the data by according to those all those features, and you'll end up with a positive or a negative label. So it's entirely possible that your learner might skip that one relevant feature and use those 20 features to find a tree that fits the data. Decision tree learners the ID3 algorithm that we've seen that hopefully you've all implemented is guaranteed to be consistent with the training data provided the training data has no noise. The training data is not is itself uh, consistent, meaning no example shows up twice with different labels. The ID3 algorithm is guaranteed to be consistent with the training data. The ID3 algorithm is guaranteed to find a tree that has zero training error, which means for any other hypothesis, the training error of the tree that the ID3 algorithm finds will be less than that, less than or equal to, right? Which means if you train a decision tree and make it bigger and bigger and bigger, allow it to grow arbitrarily big, your decision tree will overfit the training data. Here's a plot uh, from Tom Mitchell's textbook where the horizontal axis is the size of the tree. So essentially by growing the tree more and more, you can, for at every step, you can calculate the accuracy of the tree on the training data and on a test set. So the horizontal axis is the number of nodes in the tree, it's a size of the tree. The vertical axis is the accuracy. The solid line here on top is the, is the training accuracy. So just to confuse you, I'm talking about accuracies and errors. Accuracies go up, higher accuracy is better. Errors, lower is better. Uh, in the previous slide, I talked about errors. Here I'm talking about accuracy. So this is the training accuracy. Notice that the training, the training accuracy is getting better and better as the tree get, gets bigger and bigger. However, after a certain point, the dotted line, which is the gen, is a, an estimate of the generalization accuracy, actually starts getting worse. So one might say that somewhere around here is a good place to stop growing the tree because any this, anything that goes above that, a, a, any tree bigger than that is going to overfit the data. Why? Because these, notice that this gap is getting wider and wider. As the tree gets bigger and bigger, it, it's probably fitting the noise on this data more. I don't know which data set this is, but uh, uh, you see similar trends on most realistic data sets. So how do we avoid overfitting? Any ideas? Even from this picture, you might get an idea. Yes. You can limit the size of the tree. This picture gives you that idea, right? If I grow the tree to be uh, 90 nodes big, 
the true error is really bad. If I grow it to be 40 nodes or 45 here, the true error is actually not that bad. So one answer is maybe I should limit the size of the tree. How big should the tree be? I don't know. It's a hyperparameter. We've introduced a new hyperparameter. This is the first real hyperparameter that you're encountering, the size of the tree or the depth of the tree. How deep should the tree grow? And this is a choice that decides the behavior of your classifier. It decides when learning, quote unquote, stops. And a priori, up front, before actually running experiment, you can't tell what is a good value of a hy this hyperparameter. On data set A, maybe you want your tree to be 100 deep. On data set B, maybe you want your tree to be just 2 deep. So it, you can't tell without actually running your experiments. And what's the right experiment? What's the right way to do this? You use cross validation. We talked about we didn't talk about cross validation in class, but I did uh, write about it quite a bit in the homework. And you are implementing cross validation. The general theme for avoiding overfitting, the general theme of ideas for avoiding overfitting, is to uh, is to appeal to this idea of Occam's razor. Occam's razor is this uh, almost philosophical idea that says, among if you have multiple competing hypotheses favor simpler ones uh, over more complex ones. Um, this is a loose statement right now. Later on, we'll prove a formal theorem called, actually a couple of them, that are called the Occam's Razor theorems that sort of formalize this idea. Um, the reason smaller trees are better is because there are fewer smaller trees than larger trees. If you think of all possible trees that have only 10 nodes, versus all possible trees that have 100 nodes, the set of trees that have 10 nodes is a much smaller set than the set of trees that have 100 nodes. So it can't be just coincidence that uh, you can find a good small tree that explains the data. So this is an assumption. This is, a, this is an assumption that sort of permeates a lot of machine learning. It can't be coincidence that you find a compact representation that explains the data. So this must be the true explanation. That's often the sort of, uh, uh, if, if I have to pick something as the philosophy of machine learning, that would be that. So in the case of decision trees, how would you uh, favor smaller hypotheses? One answer is you fix the depth of the tree. You don't grow the tree, you, stay, you, you decide up front, my tree is going to be no more than five deep or two deep. And you modify the ID3 algorithm so that uh, if the depth is more than your limit, you stop growing and you pick uh, a label right there. You don't partition, you don't make any more recursive calls. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about how to modify the algorithm. Yes. Sorry? No, I did not imply that less data is better. What I did imply is smaller hypotheses are better. More, so more compact hypotheses are better. Hypotheses are functions. The extreme version of uh, uh, the limiting the depth of the tree is to say that the depth of the tree is going to be limited to a depth one. What that means is you pick one feature, based on that one feature, you make a decision. That's it. No, no, you are not allowed to pick more than one feature. That's called a decision stump. By themselves, decision stumps tend to be really lousy classifiers. So don't, don't use a decision stump in general. But we will come back to the decision stump because even though a single decision stump tends to be a bad classifier, if you grow a committee of them, a whole bunch of them, and make, you know, by randomly subsampling data sets, and you, that way you get different decision stumps, you get a whole bunch of them, and then you form a committee, and then you have them all vote on the answer, that tends to be a very robust model. Yes. So that you have some decision stumps here with that. It could be, it doesn't have to be every attribute. It could be a decision stump that is created from data by uh, random subsample. So the same attribute might show up more than once. Okay, so this is a this is an idea that we'll revisit later. Uh, another approach is you uh, you 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 grow the tree at every step that you are you growing. 
you have two options. Either you continue to make the recursive call to ID3, or you decide to stop right there and pick the majority label in that set as a label. You need to decide whether to make the recursive call or not. And one way of doing that is to use something called a head out set, also called a validation set or a development set. And the way it works is you're not allowed to see the test set. You're not allowed to see the test set because the test set represents the future. So you have some training examples, right? So, so let's say that you have, this is your training data. Every column here represents a different example. You maybe partition your training data into two parts. This part, I'm going to call it train. And this part, I'm going to call it the dev set. Dev for development, sometimes called validation, sometimes called held up. You train your tree on this data. You, uh, you run your learner, and then you get a tree. And at every step, whether when you're growing the tree, to decide whether you want to stop growing or not, along the way, during the learning process, you evaluate the tree on this path here. And you keep track of the development set accuracy. If you find that the development set accuracy is going down, that suggests that the tree that was trained only on this portion of the data is stopping to generalize, is starting to overfit the training data. So that gives you a mechanism to kind of automatically decide this hyperparameter. Yes. This is very similar to cross validation. In fact, this is called, that's why it's called the validation set. Cross validation says there's a problem with this approach. While it's true that this will, uh, that, you know, imagine that your dev set has only 10 examples and your training set has 100 million examples. It doesn't, imagine your dev set has only 10 examples. You're using those 10 examples to decide something about the learning process. But those that's a very small set. So you're not going to get like robust statistics about whether this tree is good or not. So cross-validation says, I'm not going to use a single dev set. I'm going to use multiple dev sets. I'm going to shuffle, I'm going to split the data into multiple pieces. So instead of splitting the data into train and dev, I'm going to split the data into let's say five pieces, and this is a kind of a discussion that we had in Office Arts uh, uh, on Tuesday. So you have these five pieces. First, you train on one, two, three, and four. You get a tree, and then you evaluate on five. That gives you a single accuracy. You repeat the process. Uh, let's say this gives you accuracy five. And then you train on one, two, three, and five. You get a tree, perhaps a different tree, right? Because you're training on a different set. And then you test on number four. So you'll notice that four was held out here. And then you get, let's call this A4. So you'll get A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, five accuracies. You take the average of that. That is the general that is an estimate of the generalization accuracy for any decisions that you made for curtailing the uh, size of the thing. So, like the depth of something. This is called the cross validation accuracy. The cross validation accuracy is the average of these validation accuracies, and it is a robust estimator in a statistical sense. Uh, it's a robust estimator of generalization. Cross validation is an important sort of an empirical approach for any sort of machine learning experiment. It's uh, it's one of those things that you know you should always think of anytime you have hyperparameters, which I ask you, what's the right way to find this hyperparameter? The answer is cross-validation. That's the right way of doing it. But what's the problem with cross-validation? Okay. But that's fine. Let's say that uh, it does not. Even let's say that it does not have a high standard degree. What is like a practical problem with cross -handling? I don't know who's. It's expensive computation. It's ridiculously expensive computation. And let's kind of es estimate how much effort it takes. Some of you are already kind of facing this with your uh, homework. 
and you will face a lot more of this going ahead. Uh, get comfortable with your programs running for a while. As an example, uh, learning algorithms in practice can take very, very, very long time to run. Uh, for example, in uh, for training large language models, it can you can have learners running for like months. Now, imagine writing some code that runs for months and you find a bug at the end. <laughs> That's horrible. So, you know, you need to be like great programmers or use fantastic libraries for this. But let me tell you why uh, this will get expensive and I'll for that. So imagine that you have five hyper five choices. So this could be like depth one, two, three, four, and five. For each one of those, um, let's not do use five, let's say we use uh, four because I don't have space. For each one of those, you have to split the data into five folds. These are each one of these is called a fold. And here, I'm, uh, this is called five fold cross validation. You can do 10 fold cross validation, three fold, K fold cross validation. So you have K fold, which means K train plus K evaluation. K, you have to train K trees and evaluate K trees. And you're doing that for each hyperparameter choice. So if you have four hyperparameters, you're running four times K uh, training run. If you have 40,000 hyperparameters and each training run takes a day, it's not going to be, it's not going to happen. So cross validation can be ridiculously expensive very quickly, which is why we need to come up with other sort of heuristics to pick hyperparameters sometimes based on things like intuition. I depth 16 is a good number. Why? Because today is Thursday. That's the kind of uh, intuition that we have to use. Yes. How concerned should we be that hyperparameters can influence each other? Um, like, yeah, are you assume they're all independent? No. Or? Uh, you can't assume that. And they do influence each other. And uh, which is why you take the cross product of all possible choices, which is why the number of hyperparameter combinations can become really large. And that's why I said 40,000. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It, 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 it behaves like a test set, except you have access to it and you use it to discover good hyperparameters. And once you find a good hyperparameter, then you put the dev set into the training set, you get a big, big combined training data, train the tree or whatever learner on all of it. Okay, so this is one approach. There are a few different ways of uh, finding good trees. Uh, there's another approach for uh, getting smaller trees, which is you don't decide a hyperparameter upfront. You don't decide to stop growing the tree. But actually, you had a question, right? Are we done? Okay. So what you do is you stop growing the tree. And uh, instead of stopping the growing the tree, you grow the tree all the way to the full uh, depth, which means you're going to overfit the training data. And then you start removing uh, leaves and you know elements from that, which cut. Yeah, because they're talking about trees, a natural word, word here is pruning. So we start pruning trees so that we get smaller trees. And then we uh, use some sort of a validation set to decide when to stop pruning. Uh, just another approach. Uh, but the advantage of doing this is what you can do is uh, instead of dealing with trees, you can convert your tree into a set of rules. If this feature has this value and this feature has this value and this feature has this value, then the label is a plus. So every path from the root node to the leaf corresponds to one rule. You have a set of rules. Rather than pruning the tree, you prune out rules. Maybe this rule is unimportant. Maybe that rule is unimportant. And uh, some decision tree packages actually implement that sort of tool. Let me quickly wrap up decision trees because uh, I feel like we've spent far too much time on this. Um, it's a popular, uh, popular machine learning tool. Uh, one of the advantages of it is that uh, prediction is easy. Uh, it produces interpretable models 
and uh, you can represent any Boolean functions using uh, decision trees. Finding the smallest decision tree with respect to a data set that perfectly explains a certain given data set is computationally intractable. So we looked at a greedy heuristic called ID3 that favors smaller trees. It's a uh, it, it is defined using this criterion of information gain, which has this uh, basis uh, in entropy. And there are like well, uh, uh, sort of uh, well worn, robust implementation of uh, this idea, actually, extensions of this idea. The C4.5 and C5, I think, um, which are out there. And decision trees are part of standard machine learning packages today. Um, if you really want an interpretable uh, machine learning uh, this, uh, or interpretable classifier. It can also be used for regression. Uh, if you're interested in thinking about how to use the decision tree for regression, the, think of the following idea. The leaf of a tree, who said it should be a label? The leaf of the tree can be a real value, a, a function that produces a real number based on the feature. So you have many different functions and the decision tree decides which function to uh, pick. Uh, decision trees will overfit your data unless you do something. In this case, uh, the something is make the decision tree small. Questions? Any questions about decision trees or anything that we spoke about? Yes. So for the class mitigation classes, we uh, would say when we get the models that we plan to run, uh, so should I pull up this picture here? Sure. Yeah. Um, how do you choose which model to go by? Unless it doesn't make sense uh -huh. to take it an average of different models. Okay. This is, a, uh, this is a good question. So the question was, I'm training so many different models. For every hyperparameter, for every fold, I have these different models. How do I know which model is the one that I should eventually deploy? The answer is cross-validation is not a procedure that produces a model. Cross-validation is a pro procedure that ranks hyperparameters. All it does is it says, this choice of hyperparameter is a good one. Then you take that hyperparameter, train one tree using the entire data set you have, and that's your best. So cross-validation is a procedure that takes a learning algorithm and a data set and a set of possible hyperparameter choices and assigns a score for every hyperparameter. Or alternatively, it's a procedure that takes all these things and gives you the best hyperparameter. It does not give you a model. It gives you the best hyperparameter. Then you take that best hyperparameter and the learner that you have and the data that you have and produce a model. And that's your that's the one that you evaluate. That's the one you deploy. Yes. Uh, how do you choose the, the size of the data set? Yeah. What fraction of the data? Uh, it's not random. Uh, it's the best I can say. Um, oh, you. Oh, I see. I see. Which examples go in the data set? It should be random. It should be random, and in fact, it should be random and a representative of the training data. So imagine that your full training data has positive examples and negative examples in three to one ratio. So there are. 75% uh, of the examples are positive, 25% of the examples are negative. Then when you partition the data, you want the dev set to have the same, the same rate. So you, this is called stratified sampling. We stratify by label and for every label you sum, you make sure that the label uh, proportions remain the same. This is like a technical detail that uh, needs to be in place for implementing cross validation. Other questions? Yes. So when we do the final parameter, we train them. So we do get the cross validation. So the way same thing we lost. So how do we do that? We use the average error or so not the average error. So every hyperparameter, um, when you run it on these pieces, and uh, you know, for there are five folds here. Yeah. Which means you get five different test sets. Yeah. So you get five different accuracies. Yeah. You take the average. The average cross-validation accuracy is the, or accuracy or whatever metric uh, is relevant here. 
the average cross validation metric is the one that is the uh, uh, performance score for that particular hypergraphic. All right. Are there other questions? If there are none, yes, there's a question. There are two questions. Yeah, I don't think you need. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, let me describe that using an example rather than. Imagine that you have a tree that says, I'm just using X1, X2 as features, and let's pretend they're all binary. So let's say I have a feature that a tree that is X1, and this is uh, 1 or 0. I go to X2 here. Let's say I go to X4 here. Let's say this is the tree. And when I'm pruning the tree, what I will do is uh, I will, uh, I, 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 since I constructed this tree, I know how many examples are in each split, right? So maybe there are 100 examples here. Let's use a different color. Maybe there are 100 examples here and uh, uh, that are positive, and maybe there are 100 that are negative. So 200 examples in total. And let's say of those, uh, 50 go here and 150 go here, of which this is, uh, let's say there are 25 plus and 25 minuses. And so you have 75 plus and minus. And let's say these are evenly split here. So this is 75 here and 75 here. Um, among these 25 pluses, let's say 24 go here and one is here and there are 25 minuses. So when I'm pruning the three, what I'll do is, I would go from the leaf up. I would say, let's consider the node X3. Do I really need it? I would say, yeah, maybe let me just get rid of it. So let's get rid of this whole thing here and then replace it with what? But I've put a label minus there. Why? Because uh, most of them are minus, so I can just prune it and put a minus. I've pruned one node. I keep pruning, I can in theory keep going up the tree. And I can keep going up till when? Till my validation set says things are getting worse. Right? Other question? Does that? Yes. How do you decide which attribute to prune or prune, uh, like name it? How do you know when to stop pruning? So I had my original tree. I can measure its validation error. I have the new tree. I can measure its validation error. I can see whether the validation error is getting worse or not. The training error will obviously get worse because I'm going to lose out on this example here. But I don't care about the training error. Does remo removing this node and putting a minus there make my validation set performance go up or not? If my validation performance goes up, I keep this change. Otherwise, I reject the change and I stop. I do not prune this node. And I go to a different node. Then essentially, when I have enumerated all the leads, I'm done. I mean, you can prune, there are different strategies here. I just described the simplest version. You can do this, you can, what I described here is bottom up. So after you can recursively keep going up or, you know, you can prune in, in the interior nodes as well. There are different strategies. And since the, the, the thing is, since the decision tree literature is so old, I feel like every possible idea has been tried out in some paper somewhere. There's like, maybe, you know, the, uh, Kansas Machine Learning Society has some paper from 1961 that has, uh, not 1961, uh, 1982, that has some pruning that removes in intermediate nodes and does something. I don't know exactly who did what, but you can imagine like, you know, if you spend like 10 minutes thinking about it, you can spend, come up with two different ideas, right? But general theme of it is you remove a node, you replace it with, in this case, a label, or maybe you attach some other feature there and you make a decision on whether you keep it or not. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here. Oh, there's a question. When you increase the depth, why is there a natural tendency to overfit the data? Let's take this example here. So imagine that the true 
classifier, X3 is an irrelevant feature, suppose. X3 was an irrelevant feature, and there is noise in my data. Because there is noise in my data, even if X3 was truly irrelevant, this block here would not exist, and really this minus would be the correct label. So that example, that one example that labeled a plus is noise. But because X3 exists, and I can find that partition, that particular irrelevant feature that accidentally correlates with data, I will choose that. The ID3 algorithm will choose that and partition. And let's say X3 is not sufficient. Maybe there are 20 features, the combination of which perfectly aligns with data. See, every feature is partitioning the data into smaller and smaller slices. And you can just by accident end up with small partitions that perfectly have only one label. And the ID3 algorithm will keep splitting the data till you come to that partition. That's why there's a tendency to overfill. Like the same with every or or no, actually, in general, uh, uh, that's a good segue into the next topic because sometimes certain hypothesis classes cannot overfit because they are not expressive enough. The problem here is the decision trees in general are very expressive. They can represent any Boolean function. So if you grow this tree enough, it will represent whatever Boolean function is in the data, including the noise. But what if your class of hypothesis, uh, uh, the, the class, the hypothesis space you're working with cannot express all functions. So no matter what you do, you can't find the, you can't overfit the data. That's a good and a bad thing. Because if you really want a complex function, you can't find it. That's a great segue into the next topic though.